Good evening, everyone. Sam, are you all set? All right. I want to take a moment just for everyone, including me, to arrive in the room. A lot of people came from far away. So if you would close your eyes, take a deep breath, let the daily grind and the to-do lists wash away. Thank yourself for making time to be here tonight. Clear your mind and open your heart. I want to start by thanking the Glazer Center for this gorgeous gathering space. To our event partners, over 20 organizations came together tonight to make this happen. And to our big champions, the Threshold Foundation and Summit State Bank, who generously support our work. My name is Kelly Rogela. I'm a localization specialist and a social entrepreneur. I co-founded the Go Local Cooperative, the Made Local Marketplace, and the Share Exchange, a model local economy center. Thank you. <laughs> a place for community relocalization to take hold. As a culture and a community, we don't often have time to get together and talk about important issues. So it's very gratifying to convene tonight's event and to share this information with you. We've all heard about the frog in boiling water. <clears throat> it should come as no surprise that we are all the frogs. It feels like the water is turning from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas. We know it's going to happen, the conditions are right, a major transition is in the forecast. These changes are so hard to see in our day-to-day -day lives. However, when we take the time and pause, reflect back in the future, project forward, look at key indicators from lots of different sources, and start talking to each other, it's very clear, the water is boiling. We are at the end of an era and something new, a better, more equitable, just, and sane way of living is trying to emerge. We all feel it. The rate of change is staggering. It's exhilarating and it's exhausting. I've said for a long time that people are like photons. Photons are both a particle and a wave. And people are both. We're individuals and we are community. It's up to us individually and together as community to decide how best to adapt to these rapid changes. Do we cling to the past, keep investing in a slow decline, or do we rush and usher in the new? Or do we find a graceful balance? It's up to us. I am thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Richard Heinberg. Richard lives and works in Santa Rosa, yet he is an internationally recognized researcher, writer, and leader in his field. He is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute. He is the author of 11 books, including a new book called Snake Oil, where he explores the ramifications of the fracking oil and gas boom in North America. Richard is widely regarded as one of the world's most effective communicators of the urgent need to transition away from fossil fuels. We are very lucky to have him share his research and insights with us tonight. Please welcome Richard Heinberg. Thank you so much, Kelly. Well, it's a treat for me to be able to speak here in my hometown um, about uh, Sonoma County's economic future. And I'll, I'll be talking about some, some trends this evening that will impact all of our lives and not decades from now, but actually, they're, they're already in, in process. But let me back up just a bit and tell you uh, a little about where I'm, I'm coming from. Uh, I wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for this book. I read it when it first came out in 1972. I was 21 years old at the time, made a huge impression. Um, I realized for the first time in my young life that the world was on a fundamentally unsustainable course. And I've basically spent my entire adult life since then, trying to figure out why that is 
and, and what we can do about it. For those of you who don't know, the Limits to Growth was a, a report of a study um, undertaken by some scientists at MIT. It was an effort to use computers to model scenarios for the interactions between population growth, resource depletion, and environmental impacts. The standard run scenario tended to show a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. Uh, they, of course, this was an unwelcome outcome, so they tried to tweak that standard run scenario in various ways by, you know, doubling Earth's resources and, and, uh, and programming in government policies to restrict population growth and preserve resources and reduce pollution and so on. But the same basic thing kept happening. It just happened a little later. Um, now, most people today who hear about the Limits to Growth study uh, hear that it was discredited a long time ago. Now, actually, what happened was the, the uh, uh, conventional economists thought that the idea that there were somehow limits to economic growth was just unthinkable anathema, and so they, t they attacked the report very unfairly. Um, I was in Australia just this last September and was able to meet the research team that did a 30-year retrospective analysis uh, of the Limits to Growth study, the Commonwealth Scientific and Indus uh, Industrial Research Organization. It's the, basically the, the premier scientific research organization for, the, for Australia. Uh, and this was the conclusion they came to. So the good news here is that we're right on track. <laughs> we're doing our job. So the, the trends that I want to talk to you about tonight are trends that were implied in that 1972 study. But we have different ways of thinking about them today after these 40 years of, of experience. So I, I want to talk about them in terms of energy, debt, and climate. So we'll start with energy. Now, energy is really important. It's hard to exaggerate this, but uh, Everything we do, literally, requires energy. And so if we have more energy available, we can do more things. We've been using energy forever. Uh, up until pretty recent historic times, it was all in the form of renewable sources of energy, and we were, we were exerting energy into our environment to get things done, to get the things we wanted, by way, mostly, of muscle power. Either our own muscles or animals, muscles, oxen and horses and so on, or sometimes other people's muscles by way of human slavery. But that's, that's the energy economy that we had for hundreds and thousands of years, right up until the Industrial Revolution, which I believe ought to be called the Fossil Fuel Revolution. We had to invent some, you know, heat engine and gears and, uh, you know, metallurgy and so on to, to get this off the ground, but once we had all those pieces in place, we found ways of using these fuels that were absolutely, you know, game-changing. <laughs> Think of it this way. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in a car, pushing your car 10 feet off to the side of the road. You know how much work that is. Imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. How much work is that? It's like six or eight weeks of hard labor. Okay, we get our cars pushed 20 or 30 miles by a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying four bucks. So that's four dollars for eight weeks of hard labor energy equivalent. You can't get labor that cheap anywhere on the planet. And that's why and how we have mechanized every process of production and transport we possibly could during the past two centuries, and that has given us massive economic growth. Now, this is what the oil industry looked like just a few decades ago, and I'm going to focus on oil because economically it's the most crucial of the fossil fuels because it's virtually all of our transport energy, and trade depends on transport. Oil happens to be our, our principal source of energy, too. We get more BTUs from oil than any other single energy source in our economy. Well, the oil industry has changed profoundly just in the last few years. 
It doesn't look like this anymore. Sometimes it looks like this, drilling in thousands of feet of ocean water and, and uh, is maybe spending a half a billion dollars on a single exploratory well, which can come up dry. The oil industry has changed in other ways. Just in the last eight years, world crude oil production has essentially flatlined. We're producing about 2.5% more oil per year this year than we were eight years ago. Now, it used to be that the, the world oil supply was growing by 2.5% every year, right? Now that's flattened out. Now, why is that? Is it just because people have decided they don't want to use oil anymore? Well, in a way they have, because the price of oil has skyrocketed, and that has resulted in in a leveling off and, in, and slight decline in oil consumption here in the United States, not so much in China, that's a different story. But when the price of oil goes up, that is a drag on the economy. We know that from history. The vertical gray bars here are historic recessions in the, over the last 40 years, and the squiggly red line, that's oil prices adjusted for inflation, $2,008. And as you can see, every time there has been an oil price spike, there has been a recession immediately following. In 2008, July, oil price went up to almost $150 a barrel, world record price. And the economy was in doldrums. Well, that's putting it kindly, just a couple of months later. Of course, that wasn't the only thing happening. We had a housing bubble crash at the same time, and so on. But the point is that we are depleting the easy, cheap oil that made economic growth happen during the 20th century. So the, the, the price the industry needs in order to go out and look for and develop new sources of oil is up around 100 bucks a barrel. But we know from recent history that 100 bucks a barrel is an economy-killing price. And that's one of the main reasons it's so hard for our economy to recover from what happened five years ago. Now, of course, we've all been treated over the last year or, or two to extraordinary claims about production of shale gas and tight oil in Texas and North Dakota, uh, shale gas in Pennsylvania and, and other places. Uh, as I say, extraordinary claims saying that we basically are in a, a new era of fossil fuels, at least in this country, and we really don't have to worry about depletion. Well, you know, it's important to see what's being claimed in context. We are going after lower quality resources. This is the, this is the, the resource pyramid that's familiar to every uh, exploration and, uh, uh, geologist. Basically, the, uh, the entire pyramid represents the entire resource base, all of the, let's say, oil and gas molecules in, in the Earth's crust. And up at the top of the pyramid are the, the resources that are easiest to get, cheapest to pull out of the ground. Now, of course, we go after the process of oil and gas production using the low-hanging fruit principle. We go after that cheap, easy stuff first. And as that stuff is depleted, we dig down further into the pyramid. Well, we've invented, over the course of the last uh, decade, technologies, horizontal drilling, hydrofracturing, uh, cluster pad drilling, that enable us to drill deeper down into the resource pyramid and get lower grade resources, but let's not kid ourselves. They are lower grade resources. In these cases, we're talking about rocks that are generally impermeable. The oil and gas is there, but it just doesn't want to flow. So if we drill horizontally so that we're drilling horizontally into that oil or gas bearing layer, we have more contact between the well bore and the, and the, uh, the fuel bearing layer. And then if we hydrofracture the rocks, we can let out a puff of production. We've changed the technology, but we haven't changed the rocks. So what happens is once that puff has been extracted, the rate of production from the well declines very rapidly. 
we at uh, Post Carbon Institute wanted to see just what was going on with these resources. So we, uh, we did a study that was published just uh, about six weeks ago or so. Uh, and you can find it on our, our postcarbon.org website. It's called Drill Baby Drill. We uh, licensed the proprietary drilling data on all 63,000 currently producing shale oil or shale gas and tight oil wells and did the numbers. This is the most comprehensive uh, analysis and review of the data that has been done to date by anyone. And uh, this, is a, this is a typical graph from, from that uh, study. And, and you can see the spectacular decline rates for these wells. Now, it's true, in the core areas of each of the plays, whether it's the Eagle Ford in South Texas or the Marcellus in Pennsylvania or the Bakken in, in North Dakota, in the core areas, the, the wells are productive and, and uh, produce decently. But outside those core areas, it's not so much. And in fact, companies are losing money hand over fist producing, especially shale gas right now. We have Lee Raymond's word for it, the CEO of, of ExxonMobil. Um, this graph also tells a story. Uh, the number of wells has increased by 90% shale gas wells, or excuse me, natural gas wells in the US, and average well productivity has fallen by 40% over the last few years. So because individual wells deplete so rapidly, if we want to keep production going, the industry has to drill and drill and drill. This is why we call the report Drill Baby Drill, because that's the, the treadmill to hell that we're on right now. This is what a shale bubble, bubble looks like. In 2008, the city of Fort Worth, Texas, received $50 million in revenues from 44 shale gas wells. Okay, 2012, the city received only $23 million from almost 400 wells. So the productivity is declining rapidly as the core areas are drilled out and the drillers are forced to move away from the core areas. Now, they've been claiming, they've been making all these claims about energy independence and 100 years of shale gas on the basis of taking the very best initial productivity of the core areas and extrapolating that to the entire play. It doesn't work that way. The geology just doesn't support those claims. Uh, this is a forecast for tight oil production based on current numbers from the Bakken and the Eagle Ford. And uh, you'll see it's, it's not going to peak, you know, in 2070 or even 2040, but 2017, okay? That's, n that's not far from now. Okay, so that's, that's the story with uh, shale gas and tight oil. How about tar sands? Same basic story. This is a low-grade resource. And by the way, this is, a, this is an aerial view. If, if you, on the roads, if you can possibly see little tiny dots, those are immense earth-moving machines. So this is what we're doing to northern Alberta in the effort to get the tar sands. Now, the energy returned on energy invested in producing tar sands is abysmal. It's about five to one. Now, if this were a financial investment, a five to one return ratio would be fantastic. But in the energy world, it's a little different story. You see, everything we do in society uses energy, including the process of getting energy. But, you know, healthcare, uh, education, the arts, uh, manufacturing, you name it, all of those things are big users of energy. So the little bit of energy that we invest in getting energy, whether it's building solar panels or building nuclear reactors or drilling for oil or gas, whatever energy we invest in getting energy has to produce a big return in order to fund everything else that we're doing, right? So it turns out that a five to one energy return ratio isn't enough to support a modern industrial society. So why are we doing this? Because it's profitable. We're taking natural gas from 
mostly from British Columbia and Alberta, and using it to cook the tar sands. So natural gas is actually a higher quality fuel, but it's cheaper. So if we can turn that natural gas into a liquid fuel via the tar sands, the companies make a tidy profit, but in energy terms, it's like turning gold into lead. And once again, this resource pyramid principle holds. Not only is our, the entire resource base subject to this principle, but also every individual uh, play or source. So the tar sands is a resource pyramid, and we're going after the cheap, easy stuff first. The, the tar sands that are being produced today are the cleanest, best tar sands we will ever produce, most profitable. As time goes on, year after year, it's going to mean digging deeper, producing lower quality resources, the environmental risks are going to skyrocket, and so on. So that's the energy situation that we're in. Uh, and we're not being leveled with by government or industry. We're not being told what's really going on. How about the debt situation? Well, we, we do hear a bit about that, don't we? What, what, what is going on with debt? Let, let me back up a bit and tell you a story. Starting at the, in the early 20th century, and this relates to energy, because remember, early 20th century, we were just starting to use oil and coal and natural gas in this country. And having all of that cheap, concentrated energy available enabled us to, again, do a lot of things that we couldn't do before, like manufacture stuff in ever larger quantities, especially using new techniques like the automated assembly line. So we could make stuff faster than people were accustomed to buying it. So the problem in the early 20th century was one of overproduction. We could saturate markets. So how did we deal with the problem of overproduction? in so, several fundamental ways. One was a new industry, the advertising industry, talking people into wanting stuff they didn't realize they needed. <laughs> and that had some subsidiary uh, uh, strategies like planned obsolescence, making stuff so that it would wear out over a predictably short amount of time, or making, making manufactured products so that they would look different every few years so everybody would want to have the, the latest model. Now, this 1910 Studebaker cost about $900. It doesn't sound like much for a new car in today's terms, but in 1910, $900 was a fortune. So there was another problem. You know, people, now people wanted to buy the stuff, but they couldn't afford to pay cash. So there had to be a revolution in consumer credit during the course of the 20th century in order to deal with the problem of overproduction and to get consumerism happening. We became, instead of citizens, over the course of the 20th century, we, we, we became consumers. That's our first duty as economic citizens. 